about so you can see that we've got yeah it takes one tanks oh yeah do you have a favorite coral species a favorite coral yeah oh man live ones <laughs> yeah there you go yeah fair enough yeah, there's, I mean, there, there's quite a few. My Cetophilia is really cool. Um, this one, I don't know if, there, there's Celia. She's a coral reproduction technician. Yeah. I can probably get her. Do you want to talk about coral reproduction for the UF uh, Naturalist Project? Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> pretty good. Do you want to give a tour? Sure. Of the facility? <laughs> the UF Naturalist Project? Is yes. That? Oh, a, do I get a mic? Yeah. Uh, should have put on makeup today. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he was talking Very about. exciting day. I'm fighting the pH probe because the O ring came off. Super fun. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I just like put this on my shirt. Corals, right? That they're growing. Got how this works? Do I just yeah. put this? Oh, my. Okay. Th that's wow. A, that's a do you want a that's name that's tag? A or do you, should I put the official? Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I mean, what would you like me? Maybe you can hand them off to Yeah, totally. Okay, so my name is Basilios. I'm the creator of the Florida Natchez Project. Awesome. This is my coworker, Adolfo. Hi, nice to meet you. Awesome nice. cable woman. Nice to meet you. Uh, oh, Debra. Mm -hmm. So the Florida Natchez Project is a project I started that wants to document the contemporary degradation of our water systems. Mm -hmm. So we just interviewed Dr. Uh, Swedaro. He was telling us about this wonderful, amazing work you guys are doing. Thank so you. if you can just tell us what's going on here and uh, yeah. that thing, yeah. Absolutely. So um, this is the Coral Reproduction Department at Moats IC2R3. The principal investigator is uh, Dr. Hannah Cook. She's the mastermind behind all this work. And I am the, um, <laughs> sorry, my intro's coming in. <laughs> um, so I am essentially functioning as the laboratory manager and the staff quality production biologist. And what's your name? Uh, Celia Lito. Nice to meet you. Um, and basically what we do here is all things coral reproduction. So uh, essentially the whole purpose of working with assisted sexual reproduction is to create new genetic diversity on our reefs. Um, why that's important is because in order for an ecosystem to be able to evolve and function on its own, uh, it needs to be able to reproduce and evolve without assistance. So how we go about doing that is we go through the process of uh, helping these corals reproduce by hand. Uh, that process is not necessarily complicated, but it is time consuming and it takes almost an entire year to complete this process. Wow. So in summary, essentially what we do is uh, we have a spawning nursery uh, out in the field. We have one at Luke and at Sand Key off the coast of Key West. Uh, and those colonies essentially house replicates of uh, large sexually mature coral colonies. Um, Sexual maturity in corals is heavily dependent on density and not necessarily age, and it also varies by species. So we will go out in the summer and we will do something called cracking, where we will look at the inside skeleton and we'll see if they are gravid, which essentially means that they contain gametes or have started the process of gametogenesis and are towards the end of that process. Um, at that point, the gametes are fairly visible. Uh, and we know that once they start to get this orange pinkish color that they are really close to spawning or probably like a couple weeks out. Um, every species looks different, uh, but the species Acroporus cervicornis, also known as staghorn coral, is a really great example that we like to use uh, because it is you can physically see it with the eye very easily. They are also hermaphrodites, so they produce both egg and sperm in the form of gamete bundles. Um, meaning that a colony could be both a mother and a father, which is really interesting because you can do reciprocal crosses with that. Uh, so once we know that they are gravid, we bring them into the laboratory uh, and we start the process of uh, well, spawning observations. Essentially, Acropora cervicornis uh, can spawn anywhere from yeah, three to 12 days after the full moon, typically in August, but it can happen in July as well. Is there a reason why it, mm -hmm. um, it, there's a connection with the full moon? Yeah, so they use uh, solar and lunar cues in order to synchronize their spawning. Wow. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a whole slew of cues, but it always follows the full moon, and we don't That's entirely cool. understand why that is, uh, but that is one of the consistent uh, cues that occur in nature. So we think that they've evolved to use that um, as a way to basically 
uh, go at the same time because one of the main issues is there's not a lot of coral tissue on the reef. So even if they do spawn, um, A, a lot of them aren't even close enough to physically interact and fertilize and create essentially sexual recruits. Uh, and another issue is because of changing ocean temperatures, um, because temperatures are a cue as well, sometimes you can experience asynchronous spawning. So if one goes and then another goes either an hour later or a couple days later, um, basically that's kind of useless. They don't interact and there's no babies. <laughs> I guess that's why the little fact that you guys are trying to, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. replicate this is so yeah. important, right? Yep. Yeah. So we're trying to help them and make sure that that process is still occurring. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, so yeah, we bring them in the lab, we observe spawning, and then we'll go through and create uh, intentional crosses with the parent colonies. And we typically have a list of colonies that we're interested in observing as far as the uh, genotype and the phenotype that their offspring will carry. And we also study the influence of whether or not one colony is a mother versus a father, uh, what colonies interact well together, because just like people, sometimes you just aren't a good match for each other. So we are interested in studying that as well. Have you guys mm -hmm. noticed any kind of... Since you how long have you guys been doing this for? And mm -hmm. in over the course of how, in over the course of that time, have you guys noticed any genetic mm -hmm. differences? Uh, you know, as you guys have been kind yeah, of yeah, there's some there. major yeah. differences actually. Yeah. So um, we have some colonies that we know are significantly uh, more dense, like they are physically larger, um, so they look a lot different. So, um, for example, one of our colonies, like. Its skeleton, I kid you not, is like that thick. Wow. It's enormous. And like when you're trying to hold it, because we carry them off of a boat and put them on, like my arms are shaking because yeah, they're so right. dense. And then there's some that are super spindly, as we like to refer, where they're um, kind of really thin and almost like they grow in like a weird crooked pattern. So there's physical differences. Um, the density of which their polyps, like the, the space between each polyp um, uh, on the skeleton, differs. Um, when they like to spawn, um, who they pair well with. And then there's also things like disease resistance, disease susceptibility, um, bleaching or thermotolerance, I guess you should say. Uh, so there's a lot of differences. And we're really interested in studying how that carries through other generations and how it evolves on its own. So, I mean, you know, in your kind of hypothesis, right, mm -hmm. kind of just, you know, extrapolating, how do you think those differences might be beneficial mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, neutral in the grand scheme of things? Yeah. I mean, so, In your own opinion, yeah, I mean, that. honestly, we don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> that is one of the things that we're studying. We know that sometimes, uh, well, actually, we're currently studying whether or not disease susceptibility or disease um, resistance is a trait that can be passed on whether it's recessive or dominant or the likeliness that it could be passed on to multiple offspring because each cross makes thousands and thousands of recruits. So just because one individual from that recruit carries a certain gene, are the rest gonna carry the same yeah. one? Like what's the probability of that? Um, but it's hard to say whether or not any of those are particularly beneficial or uh, negative in any way because in a grand scheme of genetic diversity, the diversity is what's beneficial. It needs to be able to evolve in um, Basically, we, yeah, yeah, it doesn't need, the reef shouldn't need to be babysat anymore. If you have genetic diversity and they are able to synchronously spawn together, then we are able to be confident that that reef can survive and evolve on its own when new stressors and future conditions come through that reef. Um, so it's not necessarily the specific traits that are the biggest driver behind beneficial uh, characteristics. It's more just is there the diversity the context, to push yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, but we are researching what is beneficial and negative. It's just this program has been running for, I believe, about three or four years now. So very, it's pretty yeah. early on still in this area of research. So we don't, I don't have any specific opinions or observations that may answer that question super concisely. <laughs> we just know that genetic diversity That's is good. <laughs> the most important part. So, <laughs> so would you kind of mind showing us what's kind of happening in some of these tanks you kind of have going on? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, my personal favorite tank in here is the XC2 spawning system. This is an entirely isolated closed system tank that we use. Um, this was designed by Dr. Jamie Craggs and his team at the uh, University of UK Derby uh, in the coral spawning lab. So what's really unique about this is eventually we will be able to have resident colonies uh, that are sexually mature in here. Um, and with the machinery on the back of the tank, uh, we are able to perfectly <laughs> recreate uh, the conditions that corals would use to synchronize their spawning. So wow. we can recreate the solar, lunar cues, tidal cues, pH, um, 
uh, we can dose nutrients over time to make sure that they are continuously growing and receiving the proper nutritional profile that they need in order to do so. That's awesome. Um, and then we can also change the temperature and it can actually it is so uh, accurate that we can actually change the temperature cycle throughout the day and then seasonality as well. Wow. So it's really awesome. We have only had it for about a year, but we were able to bring in some wild elk horn colonies, also known as Acropora pomata. And we were able to observe spawning this year in August, which is really awesome because they are critically endangered. Absolutely. So it was amazing to create new sexual recruits to add um, back onto the reef eventually once they're big enough. Um, and then we will eventually have some resident colonies in here for a longer period of time. And we're going to put a canopy up over this so that there's no outside influence of lights. Uh, and we will essentially try to make them spawn out of their typical season by giving them those cues. Uh, for example, what they would normally receive in August, maybe in April, because... To quickly promote spawning yeah, more frequently. Yep, right? yeah. yep. So they can only spawn still about once a year because it is uh, really energetically expensive for them to go through gametogenesis and the process of spawning. But for us as researchers, we are balancing a lot uh, in the middle of the night, in the middle of August, with multiple species and multiple colonies to keep track of. So as researchers, it will help us be able to do our work a little bit more effectively if we can have, if we can split up when we're observing spawning, and we can be a little bit more efficient with our space and probably take on a couple more projects, answer more questions. Um, it's essentially going to make our work more effective while still creating new genetic diversity at the same time. That's amazing. Yeah. And you said this is species specifically is critically endangered, correct? Yeah, so yeah. the corals that are in here currently are kind of placeholders for um, the uh, maintaining the microbiome of the tank because it is an isolated system, but uh, just like in the ocean, you want to maintain the nitrogen cycle, um, nutrient cycling, uh, and essentially, you know, recreate the ocean environment as accurately as possible. In order to do that, you have to have something that essentially eats up yeah. those nutrients and then something that converts that back into uh, a bioavailable form. So I have placeholders in here, but typically we have massive, massive colonies of elk horn in there um, during August. But we put those guys back out onto the reef, uh, and so we are confident in our ability to take care of them here. Um, we're probably going to be putting some massive species in there uh, in the near future as well. So. Um, Tastria cavernosa or, or Orbicella fabulata, which are more the bouldering species, yeah. yeah, instead of the branching. Uh, but those guys are just placeholders, but they are representatives of a species that we do spawn on a regular basis. It's just those guys are a little bit too tiny to spawn. Are those feather like things I'm seeing? Are those the polyps? That are yeah, the, the, yeah, on the side, yeah. So uh, those are their polyps, and they're really expressive. I like this tank because you can actually see them eating <laughs> and yeah. stuff. Um, and those guys, uh, what's really interesting is we've noticed that when they um, go from our outdoor raceways into this tank, they actually go through a photo acclimation process, which is why they look a little bit lighter than they do um, in the rest of our tanks. Um, it's because this system recreates the same light levels that they would experience at deeper levels, so uh, they don't have to have as dense a population as Zosanthelli in order to act as like a sunscreen. That's awesome. So you can see the same photo acclimation that we see in the field within this tank, which is really awesome. So um, they come in all different shades, and their polyps are always super extended in here, and it's a really easy way to observe their health, too, because you actually get to look at them from the side. Yeah, I've never seen the polyps. I was in the belly. Like that. mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so this tank is super cool. I think. It's really fun. It's kind of like my baby, so yeah. I love taking care of it. Um, it's so cool because, like, you're saying, it's like literally like a, it's a kind of, it's like a micro environment. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So it's um, it's really interesting and. One of the cool things about a closed system tank is because you have to maintain that microbiome, um, we have the display tank at the top, but then all the machinery is hidden in the bottom here. Yeah. Um, so we have live rock, uh, we have catamorphic algae, which is essentially an algae that you run the light cycle in the sump, as it's referred to in the yeah. bottom. Um, you run the light cycle opposite, so when that algae is uh, performing photosynthesis at night, it's actually pulling excess nutrients out of the water column yeah. to prevent unwanted algae from forming, because hair algae, leather algae, um, basically all other forms or algae compete with corals for space and it can inhibit their uh, ability to grow and sheet out and especially when it comes to sexual recruitment uh, you want nice clean rock for corals to settle on um, and although we're not settling necessarily in the sump that rock uh, behaves as a natural filter nitrifying bacteria uh, populates that rock as we add it um, and that is what allows the um, 
or prevents the buildup of ammonia and uh, air quote toxic waste <laughs> from building up in here and essentially allows you to maintain consistent pH, salinity, all that jazz. So um, it's really interesting to watch how it cycles and yeah, you can see how the corals respond to different things really easily. <laughs> That's awesome. So you mm -hmm. said this is oak coral. Um, is it, is, are the same species in these two? So the same species is actually in this tank. So yeah. these guys are feeding right now. Right. Um, that is Acropora cervicornis. Um, those are from 2020, so those are sexual recruits that were settled in uh, August of 2020. Wow. So they are older and they have also been fragmented a couple times now. So that's why some of them haven't fully covered their plugs yet, it's because they're shooting out. Um, and we both, we use both asexual and sexual um, propagation in order to increase our, the amount of tissue that we're putting out on the reefs. And that is an example of asexual propagation. We have multiple replicates, all of which come from uh, families, but every individual has its own genetically unique um, makeup. So explain the process, all right? So the, are these micro fragments mm -hmm. of a pre-existing kind of larger piece of coral? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, we went through the process of assisted sexual reproduction in August of 2020. Yeah. Uh, we settled them as from little babies. Um, they were microscopic, they look like this. Um, and then eventually once they populate a full plug, then we will fragment them into replicates because a lot like a plant, you can yeah. propagate a coral. So by taking this whole mm -hmm. piece of the yep. stem off. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's a great amazing. way to, um, I always like to describe it as copying and pasting on a computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the reasons that we do that is because we are researching uh, how certain characteristics uh, are passed on to offspring. In order to study that, you have to make replicates and see how they react to different environments or potentially take tissue samples. So if you have one plug, you have less physical tissue issue to study. So it's uh, beneficial to make multiple replicates and then we also will give some of our better performers to the restoration department where they do the majority of the out planning and um, asexual reproduction fragmentation to increase those numbers again and create more genetically diverse reefs. And we can also represent the same genotype in multiple locations throughout the Keys as if they would naturally prior to the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification and the overall decline of our reefs. So like, are you seeing that some corals respond to coral bleaching a little bit more effectively than others or? Uh, can you repeat that? Are you seeing that some corals mm -hmm. are, resp are responding to coral bleaching more effectively than others? Yeah, there's definitely, um, differences in thermotolerance, so some are more susceptible to bleaching, uh, but there is a lot of influences we have to keep track of. Genetics um, does have an enormous influence, but another thing that you have to keep track of is what type of zooxanthellae or symbiodiniaceae um, is populating the hollow biome. Like, does that have an influence? Does their microbiome have an influence? Um, is the microbiome of the offspring the same of the parents? Is that something that can pass down as well? Do they prefer the same types of symbiotic algae in their tissue? So um, just to symbolize, like, yeah. the mother's tolerance, mm -hmm. so everybody else is going to be tolerant. Yep. It's like, yep. it's just this. Kind it's a whole microbiome. War of mm -hmm. factors. That's yeah, incredible. there's a lot of factors to keep track of, wow. but genetics uh, is an enormous one, and it's definitely one that um, I don't want to say is understudied, but studying them in this fashion is relatively new uh, and clearly very beneficial because some of our corals we know that they do pass on positive characteristics. It's just um, are those sustainable for our reefs is now the bigger question. Yeah, it's a rather incredible thing, right? Because mm -hmm. climate change has been wreaking havoc for mm -hmm. I mean, at least 20 years, right? Yeah. In terms of when we've really kind of understood it. But stuff like coral stuff has only been three, four years old. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, it's almost like a race against the clock in a lot of ways. Yeah. Right? It's like, we should have been doing this 15 years ago. But yeah. You know, it is what it yeah. is now, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's it's evolving very, very quickly. This specifically the field of reproduction, and um, one of the things that we're really fortunate to have being a um, essentially an ex situ nursery that is so close to the in situ environment um, is we're able to observe uh, and basically optimize our ability to predict when these spawning windows are. So one of the biggest issues previously was just catching spawning in general. <laughs> it's really hard because you physically have to go out there, you have to get a dive team, uh, and weather is a huge issue as well. We've been rained out of spawning, diving for I can't even count how many times. Um, so now we were kind of experimental on bringing them on land and seeing if that would interrupt the cycle because we do know that stressors can possibly influence when they choose to spawn. Um, but now that uh, Dr. Cook has been able to conduct this process uh, three or four years in a row now, uh, we have been able to get further, yeah, we get the hang of it. We're better at recognizing what the signs of spawning are, um, even looking, you know, that cracking, the, checking the gravitas and looking at the skeleton. Uh, and uh, in the branching species, 
species and then also in massive species and the bouldering is completely different. Some of them are goniacores. It's either a male or a female pair, but you can't even tell mm -hmm. until you observe spawning. So how do you predict that if you well. can't really look inside the skeleton? So we now have to take drills and we dissect the inside of these cores to see if there's gametes. And we can predict if we miss spawning or if it's about to happen or if they're just not ready to go yet. So there's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> Absolutely. But that's why we use machines like the XC2 spawning system is to hopefully control some of those factors. And tell us a bit about yourself, right? So mm -hmm. are you a graduate student, do you PhD? Uh, yeah. So I actually graduated with my dual BS in marine science and biology from the University of Miami's Erasmus in 2020. Cool. Um, I did... Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I worked in the Coral Reef Futures Lab studying uh, the influence of nutrients on uh, the symbiodinium of corals. Uh, and seeing what type of chlorophyll were within those uh, symbiotic algae um, and what species and what genotypes those uh, algae or the dinoflagellates preferred. Um, and then I moved into the Nadarian Immunity Lab and I did my thesis on the impacts of sunscreens on the ability for a Nadarian model organism called Nematostella to regenerate cells. And the um, is, uh, that's an invertebrate, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. So a nematostella is kind of, it's a hydrozoan, so it's actually more closely related to anemones, but they're commonly found in estuarine environments, but they carry a lot of the same um, uh, genetic homeoboxes that corals do, and they're really easy to take care of. So we use them as a model organism so that the endangered species doesn't have to <laughs> be stressed out. Yeah, so <laughs> they're significantly easier to take uh, care of, so it's a lot easier to scale up the projects. Um, but I did an undergraduate thesis on that, and then I worked actually at a specialty aquarium store, and that's where I got my expertise in closed and open water systems. So I did a lot of open system um, husbandry prior to that, but then I was able to translate those skills into closed systems, and now we use both. <laughs> That's awesome. It, yeah. I'm, I'm undergrad too, I'm about to graduate awesome. about enough, so. Uh, That's awesome, yeah. Because you know, like, the whole point of this project, right, is to disseminate it, you know, to the public, but also to mm -hmm. my peers to kind of show that, you know, to kind of show the process of where you can go in yeah. a relatively short amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be amazing for yeah. other students to know. Yeah, you know, yeah. Some options available after yeah. graduation. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. Moat is unique in the sense that I'm still able to assist with and conduct research, um, obviously under the guidance of Dr. Cook, and collaborate with people of all backgrounds and all different experience levels and all degree levels, um, because. This area of work is, is so new, um, <laughs> we're definitely still trying to figure out a lot. So um, having a diverse background and a diverse uh, working group is really, really important for this field. So it's, it's awesome that there's opportunities for people who only have a bachelor's <laughs> like me. That's amazing. So, and would you guys like to see some Absolutely. of the babies? <laughs> so we have some more outside. Um, but this is one of our more prouder achievements. So this is... Uh, Orbicella fabulata, or OFAB for short. It is a species of massive coral, coral or uh, bouldering coral. And these guys are notorious for being somewhat difficult to take care of, um, but we were really successful this year. And so we have two cohorts. We have one from Horseshoe Beach off of Big Pine and one from the National Park Service from Biscayne National Park. Um, and as you can see, these guys are pretty tiny. Um, they have a beautiful blue hue to them once they're infected with their zooxanthellae. Um, and they are rather slow growing, but we're starting to see some new polyps form. And they grow in this really interesting pattern where um, instead of just sheeting out and branching like the acrophorids, uh, these guys will grow radially, almost like a flower. Oh, wow. And they are stunning when they're adults. Um, and their polyps stay about this size, and then they will just turn this massive boulder. <laughs> and they're super, super pretty. So do they typically stay close mm. to the ground? Because, you know, mm -hmm. obviously it's babies, right? But mm -hmm. uh, I can see them not growing up, right? They're kind of growing. They do grow up a little bit, but not in a branching sense, yeah. if that makes sense. Like the skeleton deposited uh, underneath is going to become pretty thick and almost um, bulbous yeah. <laughs> in a way. So it's almost it, a brink floor, right? Yeah, 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 very similar to that. Um, they do, I mean, just from observations in the wild and seeing larger colonies, they don't get as tall as some other species like Orbicella annularis, which is kind of like their cousin genetically. Um, they, annularis will actually grow in like almost pillars, which is kind of weird, but there's no branches. It's just like, yeah, like a column. large <laughs> conical, yeah. um, uh, pillar where these guys generally make a boulder, so we call them bouldering corals. Um, 
where the aquaporids, they make these big thickets and they almost look like bushes or um, kind of actually similar to like mangrove roots. Uh, well. yeah. So they're very, um, they're like really high flow environments because they want that flow from all angles um, and they're able to branch out and create a more rugose reef. Um, but I really like these guys. They're super, super expressive um, and I think they're really pretty and they fluoresce to the naked eye, which is super cool. Um, but yeah, we're very proud of these guys because this is definitely one of the more difficult species to raise post-settlement. Uh, and we were incredibly successful this year with, I believe, like 13,000 settlers, which wow. is really good for OFAB. And every single um, one of these kind of, you know, mm -hmm. cylinders are going to be eventually put onto mm -hmm. a reef, right? Yep. Well. Wow. Yeah, so some of these are starting to get their secondary polyps because they're starting to finally sheet out. Yeah. Um, so but in possible. general, pretty much every polyp that you see in here is a genetically unique individual. So we have a lot of new <laughs> residents that will be on the reef soon, which is, is really, really exciting. But um, Yeah. So we're very, very proud of it. And then I don't know if you guys want to go see other species we outside, yes, but I'd yeah. be happy to show you some. <laughs> um, if we run into my interns, I'll just grab and tell them to head outside. a little bit. I don't know where to put it. It's like a fuzzy thing scratching my neck the whole yeah. time so I'm not sure it's not going to like <laughs> come up on the audio. So you had UM, right? Yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, not too far from here, but I had to go back home uh, after the, the graduated into the pandemic, so I went back home to Ohio. I'm originally from. Oh, you're from Ohio. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I'm probably going to take my sweatshirt off because I'm going to have to reach into a tank. No worries. Sorry. Uh, okay. We're filming with uh, UF. They're doing a piece on restoration. So I'm just going to show them some of the babies. I'm going to dig around in some of the tanks here. So I might come over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it should be fine. We all, I just don't want Clinton to like drop something on him. I don't know where the best place to put this is. Yeah. Right there? <laughs> oh, probably not. Probably not on the blue one. Right here? Right here. Right here? Right here on the collar? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if that was like yeah. too close to my neck or something. No. Yep. All right. So, these guys covered. I'm going to open up this. Ooh, sorry. Tight space. I'm going to open up this one as well, sorry. Okay. So, these are another species that we work with. This is, um, I guess to ask, is it okay if I start talking now? Yeah, go ahead. We're good, okay. Um, so this is Acropora cervicornis, which the common name is staghorn coral. Um, these are some of our settlers from the 2021 spawning season. So these guys were settled um, well, they spawned in July and were settled in early August. Um, and this is essentially what they look like when they first settle. Um, so, with on these, there are multiple settlers on each plug. Um, we do have some methods to help encourage them to settle on the ceramic plugs themselves, but you know they can still kind of choose. Uh, you know they, they want to aggregate essentially. Um, but the issue that comes with that is because every individual, even though they can come from the same family, they are genetically unique individuals. Corals, a lot like human siblings, will fight with each other. So we have to go through the process of remounting because every single one of these polyp or not polyps but settlers is individual and they may or may not recognize each other uh, and which can cause aggression uh, between them and I say aggression lightly as far as the Darians go um, but because a lot of our research is uh, focused on genetics you need to make sure that you have genetically unique individuals separated so that you are not getting influence from uh, chimeras or false chimeras which we refer, refer to as aggregates. And what's a chimera? So a chimera um, essentially is when two genetically unique individuals will fuse together into one colony. So they can exist in mammals as well. Uh, for example, cats are a great example oh, wow. of okay. yeah, chimerism is mammals, but this is a little bit different 
different because this occurs actually post-settlement. Chimerism in mammals has to happen in the um, development in the womb, where these guys, if two individuals settle next to each other, they can fuse together, recognize each other, and then they will start to essentially grow into a colony together. Um, that is potentially beneficial. It's still unclear. and There's a lot of research into that, but for our work specifically, we're looking at unique individuals. So by hand, we will take scalpels and we will remove the individuals off the plug and then we will put them onto these ceramic plugs and give them a genet ID later in life when we have um, enough tissue to be able to either SNP check them, which is a form of um, genetic ID or genetic processing or microsatellite uh, work or microbiome work. But we will sign them a unique ID so that we can keep them separated. But right now we just have them individually labeled by their familial cross until they're old enough. Um, but this is what they look like after they are freshly remounted. Um, as you can see, they're very fluffy today, which is <laughs> good. I think they just ate, so they're probably reaching out for seconds. But <laughs> um, but these guys are actually the same age as the Orbicella fabulata babies I showed you upstairs. Wow. But because of the species differences, these guys grow significantly faster. So it kind of almost reminds me of trees, right? How you can kind mm -hmm. of graft two different yep. trees together mm -hmm. until like one thing. It's pretty yep. cool. Yeah, and I can actually... Actually, they're upstairs now, I believe. But there is, um, when we get aggregates that don't necessarily agree with each other, you can see that aggression form. They will typically form a uh, almost frilly looking barrier with their skeleton. And because uh, acropores do have a minor form of chemical warfare, um, they will start to essentially release that chemical or their mesentery tentacles, and they create like a, a no man's land <laughs> in between the individual trying, genus. Right. Yep. <laughs> so they will literally be like, this is my size, this is your side. And you'll just see like barren skeleton, which can look alarming, um, but it's just a sign of aggression. It's completely natural. It's how uh, a lot of nadirians and sessile creatures define their territory in the wild. Exactly. And that same kind of uh, chemical that they use to fight each other uh, will actually allow them to seep into the environment and then when they're sheeting out and growing that chemical will push away algae and fouling organisms so they can clear rock for themselves so it's the same process it's just we separate them so it doesn't cause us to lose tissue so you said that's they're explaining over right they, um, they essentially kind of almost send them like a scout right of the calvary end to mm -hmm. just like give it of all the other stuff that might be there, so then that way when they come in, they mm -hmm. can actually settle. So if there's barnacles mm -hmm. or yeah. whatever, it's like, mm -hmm. they kind of just obliterate it. Yeah, yeah, wow. so are you referring to like Jason's work? No, the, one, the stuff you just Oh, yeah, 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 so, um, yeah, they're always looking for like a, a clean surface, cool. essentially, to uh, move on to, and that's one of the, the big issues right now is because, you know, there was a, a big urchin die-off due to a bacterial disease in the 80s and the crab populations aren't doing too well right now and a lot of those grazers aren't there to remove excess algae. So you have a phase shift where it goes from a um, coral-dominated reef to a more algal-dominated reef and that doesn't allow settlement to occur. But why can't their chemicals attack the algae? It, it does, um, but some species of algae are a little bit more aggressive than others and especially when they're young they can't release that chemical for a little while no. and then also it's not as highly concentrated as the adults so the established colonies have typically no problem sheeting out um, but the young ones we kind of have to help out by remounting them and putting on the fresh plugs and then we maintain them by hand and then uh, when we outplant we will actually clean the spot that we're going to attach the coral to to give them a leg up is there any way to kind of promote mm -hmm. like or i don't know what to like Promote the like more of a toxicity of that specific chemical, so like mm -hmm. they can compete with algae mm -hmm. more effectively. Um, I actually like, don't know. I mean, I imagine there might be, but actually, it's a it's a very sensitive balance. So especially in tanks, what happens if you overpopulate a tank with too many of these acroporids, they can release some of that chemical, or we think that they're releasing some of that chemical. It can actually irritate themselves. It can cause like Fast. a positive feedback. So in the ocean, that's not typically an issue, but on site in these tanks, we try to keep our density at a certain level of amount of corals per tank so that they don't end up hurting themselves. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any way to particularly influence how much they release. Um, and we've noticed that some families are a little bit better at clearing space for themselves than other, but then again, we're still researching that. We don't, we don't know if it's an actual genetic influence or if there's a specific uh, cue earlier on in life that causes that, but it is, we just know it's one of the, the natural mechanisms that they use in the wild, and we can observe it here on site. Interesting. So, it's interesting. Can we then, see some of the more specimens? 
Yeah. So this is a really cool tank actually right here. Is this bring coral? Yeah. So these are actually uh, Montastria cavernosa, which is referred to as, uh, I believe it's great star coral is wow. the common name. Um, but this is a really, really cool study um, because this is one species that either has a male or a female colony. So as of now, we have no way of predicting what sex the coral colony will be without actually observing spawning. And as I reiterated earlier, it's pretty hard to sometimes estimate when that's going to happen and you can't be there for every colony to observe spawning. So there's a couple questions being answered with this project which is A, are we able to predict um, what sex each colony is uh, because we know their entire life history and we want to observe spawning with these eventually once they are sexually mature. Um, and then we'll be able to record that because these are all replicates within our outplanting pipeline. So it's important to make sure that we don't do an all-female or an all-male reef, so we want to keep track of that for our own records and to hopefully predict that more effectively in the future. And then B, uh, we want to see if we can encourage these more slow-growing species to reach sexual maturity faster than they would in the wild. So what we have going on here is we have plates with multiple replicates of the same genotype, which were formed through that asexual fragmentation that I mentioned earlier. Um, and because they are the same genotype, theoretically, they should be able to recognize each other and fuse into one larger colony. Because sexual maturity in coral is heavily, heavily dependent on density, we want to see if that will trick them into becoming of reproductive size earlier in life. Um, we don't know if it's going to work. We're still trying it out. Um, but eventually these guys, once they are fused, they will be put into that XC2 spawning system upstairs and we're going to try to spawn them and then record their sex. So, Fascinating. Yeah. So it's, it's going to take them a while probably to fuse. It's already a two-year-old project, but they are pretty slow growing. Some genets grow a little bit faster than others, so we're hoping that maybe they can be sexually mature faster. Um, it seems, but we don't know. It seems like some of them are starting to fuse, others aren't. Really, yeah. Uh, like this one's obviously pretty mm -hmm. well due. That yeah. One's a bit more, you know. Yeah, we've noticed that some of them just love to sheet out and recognize each other a little bit better, and some don't. And we try to some basically beef them up by feeding them a lot and give them a lot of sunlight, but uh, some of them just work a little bit better than others. Yeah, so some, some more extroverted, I guess. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is actually my favorite species of coral because they are actually extroverted. I think, like for example, MC11 over here. Yeah. They are so expressive. They have beautiful bright blue mouths and these big expressive polyps. And yeah, those are, are those are poly are the yeah. polyps. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow, that's fascinating. So, and I really like these guys because um, you can really see the details of their morphology um, with the naked eye versus the Acroporas are a little bit smaller. You can still see their polyps, obviously, like we did in the uh, XCG spawning system, but these guys are just, they're incredible. And you can also, I swear, when you feed them their favorite food, which for these guys I think is actually fish eggs, they, you know that they love it because they actively reach out for more quicker. <laughs> so I think that they have like, personalities. yeah, they have personalities in a way. Wow. So they're super fun to take care of. So, and, uh, I mean, I know most corals, right, typically you feed them plankton, right, or other kind mm -hmm. of small stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In this case, right, do you guys like you know, take like, a jar of eggs and throw them in the water? Or how's yeah. That I mean, so we have a, we mix up their diet on a yeah. regular basis, actually, because I don't know if it actually matters, but, you know, when taking care of an animal, I want to diversify their diet because yeah. I don't want to eat the same thing every day. I, I, yeah, but, I think it does <laughs> Yeah, but they uh, they mostly get the majority of their nutritional uptake, uh, which is an estimated amount of like 90 to 95% from photosynthesis with the symbiotic algae in their tissues. Um, but when we do feed them, uh, we essentially just take a mix of dried food, liquid food, uh, fish eggs, oyster, ground up oyster, all this natural stuff. And we uh, take a turkey baster and we puff it into their mouths. So we're hand feeding them, so they are getting the finest treatment. Oh, well, you, so you hand feed each kind of like, I don't know. Group yeah, so we do like spot feeding. Okay. So we'll just kind of broadcast it and then they'll reach out um, wow. and grab it. And uh, they can actually, I don't want to say smell, that's not the correct term, but they do have some form sense. of olfactory response where they can sense food in the water column and they will actively reach out and try to grab it. But we try to give them the best chance possible since we're trying to really uh, beef them up by putting it directly over their And you typically feed them during the day or night or um, in the mm. coast, I mean in the wild, mm. when the coast is In the wild, um, they actually mostly feed at night, if which is interesting years. when they're not photosynthesizing, but um, Listen, I guess, right? honestly, yeah. you don't technically have to feed coral if they uh, aren't bleached, if they have the algae within their tissues. Um, but it's just kind of like an extra thing to help them grow a little bit faster. 
Uh, but with these guys, we feed them every day because, like I said, we're trying to get them to get as hefty as possible. Yeah. But, uh, like, for example, a lot of our tanks with the larger acroporas, we don't even feed. Interesting. You no, know, they just photosynthesize. Um, but, you know, if we have some free time, we'll still give it to them just because, you know, it's a better quality of life and uh, it helps them grow a little bit faster. Yeah, so kind of talk about that a little more, right? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, corals, they're not plants, right? They're not animals. They're kind mm -hmm. of some weird kind of in between, right? Yeah. So it's like they're photosynthesizing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, why do they need food at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, so um, so the coral itself is an animal, but it's a colonial animal. Yeah. Um, they're, I, we think that their ability to feed is an adaptation for when they are bleached or when their um, uh, algal symbiont earlier on in life hasn't fully infected their tissues. So it's a mechanism to get nutrients without um, having that algae. And it's also a way to increase the amount of energy that they can consume uh, in tandem with the photosynthetic byproducts from the algae. It kind of almost reminds me mm -hmm. of like um, predatory plants, right? Mm -hmm. It's because, like you know, corys are Mm -hmm. Oligotrophic, right? So there's obviously yeah. a nutrient, you know, low mm -hmm. level. So it's like, I mean, just like predatory plants, I mean, it's trying to yeah. eat stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It almost seems like that's kind of a similar adaptation. That is an excellent metaphor for that. Yeah, it's wow. almost exactly the same thing, yeah. That's um, fascinating. Because they don't need to do it, but it is definitely beneficial for growth because their their goal is to branch out as much as possible or sheet out as much as possible, depending on the species. And uh, any extra nutrients that they can consume is always beneficial. Um, but it is especially important that if you have a bleached coral to make sure, you know, to feed it because that's going to be its only nutritional uptake that time. Um, but if it has its algae, it doesn't need that. It's just extra. So when coral is bleached, right, mm -hmm. it's, it's not completely dead. It, um, no. Because I feel like that's definitely like what people kind of associate those mm -hmm. two things with. It's like there's just yeah. dead coral. It looks like a skeleton, yeah, essentially. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it's not dead. It's just, it just needs mm -hmm. to eat. It's just, um, yeah, lacking the algal symbiont. Uh, within its tissues, um, it can recover from that, um, but without that algal symbiont, because it provides about 90 to 95% of the nutritional uptake and it also can act as a sunscreen um, to prevent the delicate tissues, uh, it, it can be pretty detrimental to the coral, fortunately. Um, you know, if there's somebody overseeing the coral, like for example, I do not see it very often here on site, but if it does happen, we're able to feed them and change their lighting and put them in conditions that would make them happier, but it does stunt their growth um, and is definitely stressful and we don't we believe that a bleaching event can possibly influence their um, ability to reproduce in that year as well because it is so energetically taxing. So um, it is definitely something that they can recover from, but because of a combination of ocean acidification, climate change, boat strikes, all that jazz, um, adding bleaching on top of that is really, really hard <laughs> for them in the wild. I mean, yeah, and it's like, I mean, I'm kind of thinking about the connection to humans, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, someone's been in the famine, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to have, they're not going to have kids, or if, uh, if they do have kids, it's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, the kids are going to have issues, yeah. right? So it's like, uh, I mean, just like any other kind of being, it's going to follow the same kind of yeah. general mm -hmm. pattern. Yeah, exactly. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. But fortunately, these guys have big old mouths. We can feed them super easily. <laughs> yeah. Would you care if we kind of just look at Absolutely, yeah. that kind of stuff? Um, we have some other species over here as well. I don't know if you'd be interested in that, but these are more 2020, or sorry, 2021 recruits. Oh, uh, um, they're mouths too. Right? Yeah, so these are a different species. This is Deploria labyrinthormis, which is group brain coral. So. Would you care if actually, um, can I pick up on those trays? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you mind if I rinse your hands of off course. first? Yes. Sure. Have you reached in any other tank? Oh, I'm no, so sorry, that was no, so powerful. No, <laughs> no, I haven't touched anything. Yeah, here, I can hand one to you. Um, let me see. I don't know if you want like a prettier one. We have some really big like yeah, tiles. One. Just so we can kind of get it for a yeah. little. My only yeah. request is that. Keep it in water. Keep it in water, uh, but like whenever you're talking, you think it can be out of the water for a couple minutes, but whenever you're done, just be sure to settle it down. Yeah. Yeah, so these are some. Adolfo, <laughs> can you get a picture real quick? Oh, wow. Sorry, I'm, what were you saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, these are some hefty guys. <laughs> wow, these are gorgeous. I don't even know how old these guys are. I think they've been fragmented a couple nice times, but they've been here since before I started working here. They're one of my favorites. And what species is this? This is Acropora cervicornis or staghorn. Yeah. 
That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you just set it right back on there. So how long can you like uh, pick them up and leave mm -hmm. them in the open with uh, water? Like, yeah, just for, uh... I mean, it depends. Um, so for, we know for our spawning colonies, the really large section of sure, like they're about three plus years old. Um, they have a lot of girth to them and they're pretty dense. They have a lot of tissue. So actually when we're taking them from our spawning nursery, we put them on a boat wrapped in a, a wet towel essentially okay. or a wet blanket. And they can be out of the water in a moist environment for like upwards of like a half an hour. Oh, wow. However, that is stressful mm -hmm. and I would not recommend it. That's like a worst case scenario. Okay. But these guys, uh, when we transfer them between tanks, sometimes we carry them upstairs and it's like a minute or two and they're totally fine. They suck in their polyps uh, and their tissue loses a little moisture but they recover from it fairly easily. Um, but obviously, you should try to keep them in the water as much as possible, but fortunately, you can pick them up and move them without any issue. These kind of white kind of tubular structures at the tips, what, what is that? Oh, the white part at yeah. the tip? Yeah, so that's called the apical tip. Um, essentially, that is the point of growth on the coral. So a lot of times when you're diving and you see uh, a mature acroporid like this, um, they will have a bunch of like white spots uh, around the tip of them. And some people think that's a sign of bleaching, but really they're just growing so quickly that that new tissue hasn't been infected by the zooxanthellae yet. Oh, wow. So you're seeing clear tissue and new skeleton underneath before that zooxanthellae will start to move into the tissue, which is um, really cool. So that's a sign of growth. And then there's always a significantly, I mean, this guy just got taken out of the water, so he sucked in, yeah. but there's usually a little polyp right there sticking out and it's usually really, really long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he just kind of goes forward and cuts the path for everybody else. So technically coral bleaching, but a good type of, a good type yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call it bleaching. Yeah. It just hasn't even had a chance yeah. to be infected yet. Yeah. So it's not bad at yeah. all. And I've, I've actually had people come into the lab and on tours and see this and be like, oh, your coral's bleaching. We're like, no, 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 they're very happy, I promise. <laughs> we put way too much energy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, no, 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 they are not bleaching, I promise. Um, but yeah, these guys are really big, so uh, we keep our, our flow pretty high in here too to encourage growth and make sure there's no fouling or stagnancy to the water to encourage that growth, which is why they have those really great white tips. You can actually see some of the pumps here, though, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, and the coral. Yeah, actually, I can turn off the pumps for you if you want a better yeah. shot. I'm gonna what slip pH behind. level do you keep them at? I mean, so this is natural seawater, so it does fluctuate. We don't have a lot of control over that, um, but Typically, we like to keep it between 7.9 and 8.1 pH, okay. um, which is the yeah, ideal range. Yeah, it's typically what you'd find uh, in ideal conditions in the water. 8.1 is ideal. Okay. Uh, but then again, you can be too basic, so you don't want it to go higher than that. Yeah. Um, but in the ESS upstairs, I dose um, calcium carbonate uh, or alkalinity mm -hmm. into the water column to A, maintain that pH, and then B, uh, calcium carbonate is actually what builds coral skeleton. So by dosing that, they will consume it and turn it into skeleton, so you have to re-add it back into the water. But because this is a natural source, I don't have to add anything. <laughs> the nature does it for me, so. <laughs> Just come around here and look at the polyps. Yeah, there's some really fluffy guys today. It's the, a good hair day, you see for the sure. Stuff right there? And the apical tip, actually, you can kind of see it pretty well on that one. You see how that guy's got a long oh, well, polyp yeah. coming out of the tip? Absolutely. It looks like fingers. To me, my mind's just kind of getting blown, right? Because I grew up seeing mm -hmm. stuff on National Geographic, etc. Yeah. And now I'm right here. It's yeah. like, I think it's incredible. That's how I feel too. Every day I come yeah. in and I'm always like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I work with these guys. Because it's genuinely a privilege to be able to not only work with and physically see such a critically endangered animal every day that's also so important, but also to be able to observe coral spawning on a regular basis, which is already so hard to predict, is just genuinely like Humbling. dream come yeah. true. It's amazing. Like we actually got emotional last year. We predicted it right. We're collecting all the gametes and producing all the new sexual recruits and the babies. Um, it was it was really magical. So. I mean, you're single-handedly pretty much sing saving the species, right? We're it's trying. Like, yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> Yeah. What's more fulfilling than that? It's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's all it's because well. of Dr. Cook. She is yeah. a true pioneer and has done such, such an excellent job in um, conducting so much personal research and then um, the, the methods that she uses to um, record her data and cross-examine with other researchers to make sure that we are optimizing every part of this process is just incredible and it's, it's genuinely an honor just to help her with this process. And that's what Dr. Spadar was saying, right? The difference mm -hmm. between what you guys are doing here as opposed to mm -hmm partners in Australia or yeah. whatever, it's just that it's a lot more of a systematic, kind of holistic mm -hmm. approach, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing. I mean, it has to be that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, nature already wrote the blueprint. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well yeah, but yeah, these guys are very fluffy today, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> they love the sun.
And then we also have one more species in that tank if you're interested Absolutely in seeing. Absolutely, right? <laughs> um, So this is Deploria labyrinthormis, also known as groove brain coral. Oh, wow. Uh, and we call it D-Lab for short. These guys are really unique. It's actually our first time working with um, recruits, and they were given to us with our partners uh, at the Florida Aquarium. And these guys are really unique because uh, it's really hard to predict their spawning window. So, right here, right? yeah, yeah. So they gave us the fertilized larvae, uh, which is a batch cross, and we settled them. Um, and so these guys are not even a year old. I believe they're about nine months old. Um, and what's interesting is because when you think of brain, brain coral, you think of a brain. It's a, it's a labyrinth, hence the name labyrinthormis. Um, but these guys don't look like that at all. So we are currently observing when and how that labyrinth forms because they look just like individual little pockmarks and individual recruits. Um, so I'm excited to see when they start to look like their parents, essentially. So, But these guys are really, really cool. They're also very expressive, long, long tentacles and they eat really well, that's for sure. And these guys are also really fun because, uh, and this happens in all recruits, but it's especially noticeable in these guys. When you feed them, they actually burp. <laughs> so. Do, and what, what is it, do bubbles come out? Yeah, it looks like they have a bubble in their yeah, mouth and it just so like cute. releases. And I don't fully understand why that is, but it's always at their feeding and we think it just must be um, a gaseous byproduct from their digestion. And, um, you know, they eat and release waste out of the same uh, orifice. So that must be burping or farting, whatever you want to refer to yeah. it as. Um, but when we were doing initial observations under the microscope and they were super tiny, we were seeing these gas bubbles form. We were like, oh my gosh, like is something wrong with them? We're like, oh no, they're just like babies. You gotta burp the babies. So that's cute. <laughs> there's a lot of similarities between human babies and coral babies actually, because they also have choking hazards. Sometimes oh. they try to grab things that are too big for their head no way. and we have to pull sponges out of their mouth and things like that. Oh my so God. you gotta literally babysit like, them. <laughs> but, delicate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, they'll be fine they can spit it out eventually but oh, yeah. we, we help them <laughs> well that's kind of like burping them wow but these guys are definitely one of my favorite species uh, also because they are very and expressive what's the common name uh groove brain coral groove brain coral. Mm -hmm. oh, oh so this is brain coral yep oh that's amazing mm -hmm. but they look completely different than their adults so i'm really excited to see when that transition will happen because it's not very well studied so well the interesting metamorphosis for sure absolutely well, uh, um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but uh, unless there's any more of the facility you want to show us, mm -hmm. um, I think that's about it. Um, so as far as my department goes, yeah. this is pretty much all the physical corals that we have on cool. site. We have a huge component in the field as well um, with our spawning nurseries, and then we do a lot of out planning as well. Um, but a lot of our work beyond, you know, post-settlement care, once we were reach adult size and are fragmented to have multiple replicates and we've completed all of our end of research, we then pass them off to restoration, which I'm going to bring you to next um, to show you what the next part of the restoration process is. That's so amazing. I'll show you that. Uh, it. This is pretty much it for reproduction and the babies. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. Um, I'm gonna cover these guys up really quickly because they're sensitive to light. Oh, and I don't know if you want like any shots of this tank, but these are all remounted coral. So we're in the process of removing them from those plugs and then putting them in here. But like, for example, this is a great uh, example of the differences that influence can have based on familial crosses. So these guys are enormous in this family, but like, for example, like these guys, same exact age, just different family. Wow. Look how much tinier they are. It's crazy. So, different family of coral? Mm hmm. Uh, family as in like uh, taxonomic yeah. or? Uh, uh, yeah, so they're all the same species. Okay, so, it. taxonomically, they're the same. Genetically, they're different because um, oh, wow. and you can see how we label. So, 7S yeah. by 50E. What that means is that we took the sperm from colony 7 and the egg from colony 50 and we crossed them. And then we also did a reciprocal cross, which is right here, 7E by 50S. Um, so they, each colony has the opportunity to be both a mother and a father. So that's what I mean by reciprocal cross. Yeah. And um, what's up all these snails? <laughs> <laughs> they're our lawnmowers. They're yeah. my favorite coworkers because they prevent me from having to scrub a bunch of algae all the time. Fair enough. They're like Roombas. 
Yeah. We just put them in here and they eat all the algae for us and they live a, a pretty good life. <laughs> yeah. Enough, right? So yeah, they get a nice temperature controlled, very clean, <laughs> nice area. <laughs> I noticed this like one specific type of snail. Is that like uh, is there a reason mm. behind that? Or yeah. Just... So this right here, if this guy will let go, this is an astrea snail. Astrea. Um, so these guys are herbivorous. They don't. We're not worried about them eating the coral at all. Um, so we use them for the adult corals and corals that are a little bit larger. But then along the bottom, we have tiny little black snails. Yeah. And those, um, we just call them black bladder snails, but I don't believe that is the <laughs> formal name. I think they're called Battleria. Um, but those guys we typically use, and we collect by hand, by the way. So like during the summer, we go out to Horseshoe Beach and we have a permit to collect uh, all these intertidal snails. Um, but they are also herbivorous and very hardy and we use them at the earlier stages of life uh, for corals because even though neither one of them is going to necessarily eat the coral, they are significantly less dense and less likely to drag their shell across the really soft tissue of the babies. Um, so yeah, we're mostly transition once they get to be about this size, which is why we have both in here. Um, and they eat the algae just the same. It's just these guys are definitely a little bit more effective. They're stronger, they can move a little bit. They can actually climb the racks versus the battle area, which we only use in the smaller life stages because less efficient, but less likely to damage a coral. Yeah, we were by some tentacles last night and we mm -hmm. saw a bunch of these literally everywhere, especially yeah. these bladder where it's like, yeah. I mean like, they're everywhere. Which is piles on them, mm. Jesus Christ. You know, like, they, it literally looks like freckles on the beach. There's, yeah. there's so many. Like um, millions. And we collect like 5,000 at a time. Oh, wow. We can just scoop them up and put them in there. Um, and then we quarantine them for like a week and then we uh, wash the outside of their shells just to make sure they're clean and they're not bringing any um, contamination into the tanks as well because uh, snails have the ability to carry water from their natural environment yeah. with them to wherever you put them next. So we basically have them release their gut <laughs> so that they don't bring anything from the wild into our nice clean tanks. Cool. But yeah, so that's why we have different snails. Right. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when they're all remounted and they start shooting out and these are all individuals because we have separate them and we don't have to worry about aggregates or chimeras forming at this point. Cover this back up. And these guys, because they're smaller, they're a little bit more sensitive to light, so I just cover them uh, at about noon uh, versus these guys, which are big and have been here for a while, so I'm not worried about them. On the I don't know. It's, it's not one of my plugs. Ah, thank you, but these ceramic plugs are actually biodegradable, which yeah. is one of the reasons oh, that we use them. Cool. So whenever we're done with them, we just chuck them on the ground. Because <laughs> they're just like limestone rocks, so. But yeah, thank you, good eye. But I guess I'll uh, bring you up to the restoration department and they could talk about a little bit uh, what the next part of the process is. Do you care about actually keep one of these? Uh, I don't care. Oh, cool. Publicly, or is it like a... Yeah, so it's going to be on our YouTube channel. Okay. It's going to be part of the YouTube Photo Archives. Okay. So if someone 40 years young mm -hmm. wants to do research on corals, awesome. and with things have been going, they'll be mm -hmm. looking at your interview. Awesome. Yeah. That's really exciting. What did you say the name of the YouTube channel was? Um, it's called the Simo Proctor or History Program, okay. SWAP. Um, when we have these send release, we'll send you the information. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. They find something cool. No, they just, we lost them. <laughs> What'd you say? What? I'm going to ask questions about the filtration system and how does it function? How does your uh, filtration system function over here? Or how does it yeah. work the process on that? I may actually not be the best person to talk specifically about this, but um, essentially this is the chaos system, which is climate acidification ocean simulator. And uh, there's essentially a lot of machinery and heavy filtration all the way down to I believe like one micron filter socks in there that allows temperature control, pH control, um, and full water parameter control, including nutrients, um, so that we can potentially recreate uh, predicted conditions and see how corals will respond to that. So we're going to try to see if corals will be able to adapt to future predicted conditions, essentially. But we do have an entire team dedicated to that, and I probably shouldn't elaborate on it because I don't want to butcher it, but they are the experts on it. <laughs> I'm pretty good with the filtration that we use in our lab, but that is a little bit of a different animal. <laughs> But it's a very, very big, big system with lots and lots of turning parts. 